uh, my name is Spencer Crum. I work for IBM. Um, this is a talk called Secure Peer Networking with Tink. Um, the slides are on my GitHub, and they'll be part of the um, scale slide spamage that will come out, I'm sure. Uh, can the people who are on the, the left side of the room do me a favor and, and like just kind of shift to the right? Because you know, when someone opens that door, they're just going to try to sit down right there. So just makes it easier for everybody. Um, so I work on, at IBM. I work primarily on OpenStack. Um, I also work with the Puppet community. We renamed a GitHub organization to Vox Pupuli. Um, that's where a lot of my open source contributions come from. Uh, specifically with OpenStack, I work on the infrastructure project, uh, which, which, which means we run the, the CI system for all of the OpenStack. So two, sometimes 20,000 jobs a day goes through our CI system as well as code review and stuff. Um, I am from Portland, so when I travel, I like to show people what Portland looks like, Portland, Oregon. I know a lot of people think rain and other problems, but we're actually a very beautiful city with a pretty epic mountain in the background and more green trees than Californians can even conceive of. Um, this is a talk primarily on Tink. Um, it says that console's in it in the slides, uh, which is true, like console's in it, but if you're here primarily for console enlightenment, this probably will not bring you to glory, unfortunately. Um, so the two pieces of software we're talking about here are Tink and Console. And these two pieces of software kind of follow like an inverse proportion between usefulness and website awesomeness. So if you look at the Console website, there are like CSS3 transitions, there are JavaScript starbursts flying around, and it's actually kind of hard to use. If you look at the rsync web page, it's got H1s and H2s and divs, and rsync works great. Similarly, the Tink website is made, you know, probably in like 2004. It's got a PayPal donate page, and that's the only image. Um, it's that kind of like low key. Uh, the logo itself is, is also there, but I'm not even really sure what the copyright status of that image is. I'm not going to comment on that. Um, so this talk is mostly about Tink. It's not that much about console. So. Tink ultimately is a virtual private network system. This is the obligatory noisy picture of a VPN. Um, we have some classics like the firewall, or uh, yeah, we have the wall that is on fire. We have the mainframe servers, the, the strange blue, I guess, film reel highway thing or something. Um, but uh, Tink isn't really like your open VPN. It isn't like your IPsec VPN. Um, it isn't a point-to-point -point kind of thing. It's, it's, it's where, where a traditional VPN, you have a fleet of laptops or something that all connect to one or maybe two in a high availability pair of VPN servers and then get access to a network behind that. Um, Tink is a mesh. It's a distributed mesh um, with routing. So a node will come up and connect to one or any number of nodes and then have access to the entire network. And we'll look at some kind of graphs of what that looks like in the past. But it, in our setup, the setup we have, um, every node talks to every other node mostly. Um, so some, some fast facts about Tink, just some, some quick information. It's from the era of this cell phone. They started working on it in 1998 in C. It's still going strong. Uh, it's got two developers most who have written most of the code with a lot of drive-by patches from various humans. Um, I am not one of those developers. I'm just an enthusiast, so it's it's fun to dust some. You know, the whole talk really is about this thing we dusted off that have been living in Debian repos for a long time, and started getting some use out of it. And I figured I'd talk to scale about it. Um, it. It behaves just like a Unix daemon. You don't need like a kernel module or anything. You need like the ton tap driver, but you don't need anything special beyond that. Um, their development is done kind of weird. So. It's kind of the classic old school pre-GitHub development workflow that's been modified by GitHub. So like if anybody works with Apache, you can still mail a, patch, a, mail a patch to most Apache projects and they'll apply it. But you can also open a pull request and they'll merge it. And there isn't really good standardization around that yet. But there is a dev mailing list that's very good. There's a free node channel that's really good. And Gus, who's the guy who writes most of the software, is very responsive on both, both forums. Um, we looked at using Tink internally when I was at a last job, and what we found is that for bulk file transfer, we lost about 15% of performance when we're moving our, our stuff over Tink. Um, so that's there. Uh, it's also worth noting that like the SSL has not been like independently verified by other people, so I wouldn't bet the farm on it without spending a fair amount of time looking at it. 
Um, but it's old, right? It's old. It's got port 655 and Etsy services. Um, so that's pretty cool. All right, who remembers this, huh? The network is the computer. Um, and I'm not even really sure what this is. It's like a mouse pad or something with a handle. Um, and this guy is really excited about his business flying into the computer age. But this is kind of an idea. So when I was in college, we had an old network that had been written in this era and never changed. And it was a very special network and not really modern. But it had some really awesome things about it, right? Like all the machines, all the printers, everything had a public v4 address. And everything, you know, there wasn't really a firewall. Everything was just kind of connected. And this, this was kind of weird, but it also meant that the, def, the, the distinction between a server and a client was a little more muddled, a little more vague. And so you could just write a little daemon and start running it on some Linux lab machine, and other people could start using it. And the next thing you know, it's like a service. <laughs> people <laughs> depend on it. Um, any, any node could hit any other node. It's fundamentally flat. There wasn't a lot of firewall rules. There wasn't a lot of NAT rules that prevented these kinds of connections. Um, and we've really gotten away from that. Like Everything now is HTTPS. It's the only port. We don't even need the others. Um, and that's kind of lame, because if you want to share files or have a conversation with someone, you've got to do it through some abstraction layer built on top of HTTP, which is really annoying. So if you want to run your own services, there's something like OwnCloud. But if you don't want to do that, and you just want like a file transfer protocol, it's, it's basically out the window. You have things like Dropbox and Google Drive, but then you're giving all your data to them. And it gets kind of not the greatest thing. So my friends and I were like, what can we do? We found this Tink thing, we started dusting it off, and we said, we're going to build ourselves a mesh network and see where it goes. And so what that meant is that every, most of us, you know, five or six of us, installed the Tink software and started the daemon and configured it so that we would start connecting to each other, which is probably different than 99% of Tink deployments, because 99% of Tink deployments is somebody who wants to build a VPN for their servers that they control, or their network that they control, or their laptops that they control. So it's one administrative domain. So we have a different problem, because we have six or seven administrative domains. And, and people, this is all free time, hobby project type stuff. So sometimes it's off, and nobody cares. So we'll deal with it later, right? Um, so yeah, there's a blurry line between the workstation and the server. We run it on laptops. We run it on home routers. We run it on rack space gear that's just hanging out in the, in the rack. Um, and a couple of the random places. So let's, let's look at what the, the network looks like. This is a picture, uh, a, an actual like valid picture of Tink. So Tink is kind of a cool name, and it will dump the network state um, as a dot file every minute to a special place in var, which is kind of cool. And then you render it with like dia or something like this. Um, and so we can see, I've, I've anonymized all the names to be just numbers, but we can talk about the graph still. So the easiest thing to identify is that some of the nodes are on the bus and some of the nodes are not on the bus. <laughs> They're just not connected. And so what that means is that those, those nodes, which were tink daemons, were connected, and my tink daemon has not forgotten about them. They're just not connected right now. And so if they come back, we, we know who they are. They're not going to come back with a unique name or a unique number. Um, you also see that there are maybe two classes of nodes inside the graph, right? There's nodes like 1 and 10 that only have one connection in. And then there's other nodes that have multiple connections. And so the way Tink works is that you only need to connect to another node that is part of the mesh, and then you have full access to everything else. Um, if you have multiple connections, Tink will automatically kind of pipe it, sends packets back and forth, it tests them to you, and it texts transfer times so that it can find the most optimal path to send your network traffic down um, on its way. And so it's self-recovering. So if, if we lost six, or if we, if we lost two, you know, we could five, nine, six instead of 526 or whatever. Um, and it solves. Uh, so it routes around failures. It continuously prompts for efficient routes. And every node, essentially, is a daemon. And that daemon is responsible for two things. It's responsible for a subnet and an IP address. Um, and really, the IP address is kind of optional. So in a traditional like OpenVPN, if you connect up to the OpenVPN, you get issued like a 10 dot something IP address, and that's your IP address that is your source IP address as you hit every server inside the network. Um, with Tink, when you connect up, like the node number one is assigned a, a subnet, and as an operator, you choose the size of that subnet. So what we did with my friends is we took a slash 16 out of 10 space, so 10.0.0.0 slash 8, and we sliced 10.11 
dot zero dot zero slash sixteen. So that's I don't know. It's a lot of addresses. I think it's like sixteen thousand addresses or something like that. Um, and we decided that the entire Tink network, which is flat, would be represented in that slash sixteen. And then each node we assigned a slash twenty four to. Um, then we found out that some humans, so that was when we were assigning a human, a node, and, an, and an, a subnet. And then we found out some humans run more than one computer, and so each human had a slash 24, and they started slicing their slash 24s up and, and creating nodes inside that slash 24. Um, so each human gets a slash 24, each node gets something, usually a slash 24, unless it's like a child node. So these, this node 1 and node 10 are, I, I, I honestly don't remember anymore, but these nodes are probably laptops that are connected up to a superior node, and they just have like a slash 31, like one address. <laughs> People with me, kind of? OK. So making diagrams with open source tools is hard. I did my best. This was a lot of work. <laughs> I'm sorry it's not better or labeled or even circles, but you know, where are the open office devs? Take my money. Um, <laughs> OK, so it has a concept of connect to. This is literally a word in its config file. So when you start a tink daemon in Unix, uh, it reads its config file, and it looks at the list of things to connect to. And it sends sort of the tink version of sin. Um, hey, I would like to connect to you. And they, they negotiate. And if it's authorized, they make a connection. So a node like this bottom node is kind of the classic laptop node. It, it, it just connects into the thing that it knows to connect to. Nodes like this one are pretty well connected with um, both things connecting to them and um, I guess you'd call that like a reflexive connection or a, a, a recursive, not recursive, but you know, it's a, it's a bi-directional connection. And again, this is, this is looking at uh, sort of the connection path. Once the connection is made and established, you have a graph that looks like this where, all, where traffic flows backwards and forwards across everything. Um, So this, this um, basically, the difference between what makes up like a node like this one and a node like this one is that the node at the top probably has a well-known public IP address, which allows something like a laptop or something that doesn't have a well-known public IP address to connect to it. Um, and so there's a couple different classes of nodes, like I discussed. If you have a piece of gear in a data center somewhere, which some of us do just for reasons, because, you know, nerds, um, that's a great node for Tink, right? But if you have a laptop that's running around and conferencing and all this stuff, like it could have any IP address of the world, so it needs to make an outgoing connection. Then there are things like in the middle where someone has like, I think in, around here the, the ISP is Cox. Is that true? The ISP is Comcast? What's the LA I, ISP? Charter. Joy. OK, so some, somebody has Charter, and they like, you, know, you have Linksys, and you port forward off to some, some well-known port, and so you use like DNS, Dyn DNS, or something like that. Um, so that controls, and so, so for p things with well-known IP addresses, talking to well-known IP addresses, it's usually symmetrical. There are also places where people join the network at different times, just because it's kind of a friend social group. Right? It's not actually administratively controlled by someone with like Puppet or something who's doing it like right. So probably what happened is that this person was one of the earlier nodes, and so his or her key is published widely. And when this person joined the network, um, this person never bothered to update configs to, to connect to this person, basically, is what's happening. So how is Tink authenticated and secured? So the security layer is, is kind of beyond me, but the way it's authenticated is that every Tink daemon that starts up generates an RSA key, a, a public and a private key. Um, and then you put, you know, obviously you keep the public key or the private key on the Tink daemon node itself, and then push the public key out to everybody else. And there's a directory called hosts in the config file, which we'll show later. And that hosts just kind of has the IP address of the thing, the subnet it signs for, and its key. And um, once you're connected, you're connected. So early on in the process, when it was kind of figuring out who our friend group was and who we were going to let do this and stuff, we got to the idea, like, I want to let Alice connect to me, but if Alice adds Bob, I don't want to answer for Bob's traffic. I want some way to shut that down. And so we looked into it a little bit harder. And so at an IP layer, if you send a packet from one IP address on the Tink subnet to another IP address on the Tink subnet, it, you get no trace route there. It just goes in, and it comes right back out with zero hops. Um, 
at the tink layer, there's really no tooling to say, I'm not going to allow from this network, I'm not going to allow from this network. This, there's no concept of like a, like a time to live across it. Um, and then somebody pointed out like pretty smartly that if, if, if we already allow traffic back and forth with Alice, like Alice can just nat for any traffic that she wants. And so there's nothing I can do to prevent Bob's traffic from getting to me at that layer anyways. So we decided we'd, we'd calm down and, and stop bike shedding it and just trust everybody. Um, it's, it's interesting, this it's, isn't an overlay network like Tor or something where it's public and anybody can join. Like you have to, someone would have to say, Spencer, I would like to join your network and then give me a key and I'd give them a key and then we could start communicating once we configured our daemons and restarted them. So when you get to daemon configuration and control, the Tink daemon is, is pretty cool. Um, it's like, I don't know, I guess the word is old school. It's kind of before my time, but you control it with signals. So in this example, what we're doing is we're sending the user two signal to the Tink daemon, and then we're just looking immediately at syslog. And so when Tink gets that signal, it dumps connection state information as text into syslog. And so you can get some kind of useful stuff, like the IP address of the connection. So you can see this is a bidirectional connection, and you can see there's weight. This is the um, example network I set up so that I could show you things, because I didn't want to violate all my friends' privacy. If there were more connections, you'd see that they would all have different weights. And those weights are used in determining which way we send packets out. And, um, and, and, and again, Tink is constantly pulling those and making sure they're the same. You also have a subnet list. So you can see that Spencer has a slash 25. You can see that Bicaro has a slash 24. Um, and this gives you an idea of which hosts are available and which subnets. Um, this is great for kind of just as an operator, being able to say, I need the status command over here, then look. Um, it has a couple other things. So it has user one and user two both dump informational information. and int, the, the sig int, which is what you get when you control C, does not actually kill it. It uh, increases logging verbosity to five, which is kind of cool. So you can, if you, things are getting weird and you want to see what's going on, you hit it with an int signal, you go read syslog for a while. Once you've solved the problem, you hit it with five again, it goes back to normal logging, which is great. It's actually really, really nice. It's better than something like Apache where you have to go through a whole reload restart just to pick up more debugging information. However, if you're running Tink like the first time you're running Tink and you've got it in the foreground and you hit control C and you would like it to stop and it gives you more things, <laughs> that's not the best experience. Um, it has two more control signals. It has SIG alarm and SIG hub. So SIG hub does kind of what you would expect. It rereads the config file. So if, if you're bringing a new node in, HUP will have your machine reread keys and things, and so a new node that's connecting to you will be allowed in right away. Alarm is like that, but better, so it'll reload all configurations and try to make an outgoing connection to any host it doesn't have an established connection to. So you can add more connect to's, SIG alarm, and it'll connect over to them. Um, I decided that this getting status, it was, it was cute, but not DevOpsy. so, you know. <laughs> I wrote a utility in Go that uh, has an HTTP endpoint. So you would curl at this, you know, 9,000 tinkstat, you just run dot slash tinkstat, right? And then when you curl at it, it would do the hupping, and it, or not the hupping, but it would send the user to, grab the log file, and then parse the log file, and then, uh, you, you, you know, dump it out in JSON. And then from this, you have a programming interface that you can start to make really intelligent things. Really, all I wanted was status in my, in my task bar, but, you know, why not? Go big or go home, right? Um, so Tink right now is at 1.0. A 1.1 release is on the horizon, and that has a couple of things. It has a Tink info, so you can just type Tink info IP address, Tink info subnet, Tink info something, and it will dump relative information for that. And of course, as we develop, we can figure out what we actually wanted to type after Tink info and make sure that that's supported too. Also, if anybody's used HAProxy, Tink took a page out of their book, and there will be a little control socket that you can kind of write, you can netcat things to and get things back. And, and that, that'll be a, a much better interface than, than what I've got here. <laughs> okay, how are people doing? Not totally lost. Awesome. So then we got to this phase, the Ian Malcolm scientists. Um, yeah. Okay, so if you, you have your friends and you turn on all these services, there's a few things that, once you have an overlay network with a flat IP space, there's a few things you can just immediately start doing. Like you can just run Apache. You can use UPnP streaming just really easily. Um, if anybody wants to VLC stream a movie, they can, right? It's, it's, oh, are you over there? I'll just stream it to you or something like that. Um, which is almost more fun than useful. Um, also, for anybody who still plays StarCraft, like me, 
um, you can play StarCraft over this, which is pretty sweet. But, all right, so if you remember, we had goodles of information. We knew that Spencer's stuff is somewhere in this slash 25, so one of those 128 addresses is probably doing something. And one of these 256 addresses is probably doing something for Bicaros, but discovering that is super hard. So, DNS. Well, I need to know DNS. I want to go to files.spencer.com or whatever, you know. And so we were like, DNS. Okay, so we look at what other people are doing with Tink. And, and so we did the first obvious thing, which is that we started a host file. We started copying the host file from person to person and modifying the host file, you know. And that actually worked really well for a little while. For those of you who were around at the early days of the internet, I'm sure it worked really well for like a couple of years. Because while it's just being added to, that kind of eventually converges on maximum file size, right? But then once people start repurposing servers and IP addresses and turning services off, it becomes a nightmare that's way out of date and inconsistent. So, okay, well, there was this thing they did after host files. They, did, they set up DNS servers. So we set up a DNS server. Somebody set up a bind, and a couple of people set their resolve.conf to look at it. And that was kind of that, because when one person runs a bind on their server, that doesn't help me at all. I can't push data into it. You know, we don't, I don't know how to do a zone update. And so that, the server sat there for a while, and it got no utilization. And the, we were right back where we were using host files. So the bind server didn't work. And so kind of we stepped back a little bit. And we said, all right, well, we have multiple administrative domains, but we want like shared mutable state. And it needs to, more than that, it's like, Obviously, we could just write to like a MySQL server or even like a DNS zone file or something, but that server is going to turn off randomly because this is all just weird hacker gear and Raspberry Pis and stuff. So we wanted shared, mutable, highly available state. And we've already devops so we'll, there's, there's something that has shared, mutable, highly available, um, kind of, you know. Uh, we could do hip stuff. We could, we could do the hipster things, and we could set up etcd. How many people know what etcd is? That's like a third of you. Okay, so etcd is software from Corio, I mean CoreOS. Um, it is an implementation of the Raft consensus protocol, and is largely a copy of like Zookeeper or Chubby if you worked at Google. Um, and it's, it, the, the way it was described to me, the reason they needed etcd is because when you start Docker containers, they don't have a writable root or writable Etsy. So if you can't write the Etsy to file system, you can write it to the daemon. So it's the Etsy daemon. Um, I don't know if that's apocryphal or not, but that's, that's a good way to think about it if, if you're not super familiar with it. This class of software, along with Chubby and Zookeeper and stuff, is, is sometimes referred to as a distributed lock manager. So like on the local system, when we're in Unix, we write a PID file, and that's kind of our lock. Like I'm, I'm running this. I'm already running something, you know? And that way you can check, your daemon can check the PID file before trying to reserve the port and getting kicked out. Um, the distributed lock manager brings that to clusters. So you can have multiple machines and they say, hey, is somebody already running Nagios? And they're like, yep, somebody's already running Nagios. They're like, cool, I don't need to run Nagios. Um, which is good, because I don't want to run Nagios. Um, and so like, when you look right at it, it's like an HTTP interface to this weird Go daemon. It, it supports like one, three, or five, or nine etcd nodes, and it replicates data all between them. It has a strong, the RAF consensus algorithm gives you a strong guarantee that if you write something, if the write is accepted, then that write is written and committed to. And if you read, you also have con strong consensus. And well, the cool thing is that it, it supports the idea that you could have multiple masters, and one of the masters can just disappear for a while, and they'll just keep on chugging. They'll just keep on chugging. And if and when it comes back, it'll get new data. And so we kind of turned etcd, which is, again, run usually by one administrative domain. We decided that we'll use this as the shared way of, of kind of sharing a data set. Um, when you look at it, it ultimately looks like a hierarchical key value store. So there's an ls command, and you can ls the directory and like get keys out of the directory. Um, mostly, I put strings in. If, you want to know more <clears throat> about etcd, like you can put numbers, you can put IP addresses, you can put like counting locks, like semaphores. Um, and so we do the thing that kind of makes sense. We start writing like hosts, we make a host directory, and in hosts we write names, and in those names we put IP addresses. And it's like, it's not DNS, but it's a, a shared way to write that kind of information now that's not just like an etherpad. Um, so we decided to do something kind of stupid. Uh, <laughs> 
This picture, by the way, I just, I just love this picture. This, there's so much going on in this picture. So, like, what are they doing up here? Like, this isn't like boxes. <laughs> this is like some kind of a tank <laughs> with a compressor. <laughs> Is this, is this a compressed, like, gas? Because if it falls, it's going to burst and, like, take out a wall. <laughs> okay. Well, what's he doing? Is he holding the forklift? Is that his job? It's don't, oh, I got this. It's not going to fall over. <laughs> is this guy supervising? He's not holding any controls. He's just making the system more unstable. And if you follow, if you follow all their eyesight, right, it's all directed at you know, the interesting part. But what's interesting is this tire. Because you look at this tire, you see the ground's probably like here, you know. You look at this tire, and you're like, oh. (laughs) This thing is in the process of tipping. (laughs) Anyways, I would love to see the follow-up of this. I don't know what happened. I don't know where it happened. I just, I want to know. So we decided to do something stupid. So, uh, how many people know about the file in Etsy called nsswitch.conf? All right. This is when I'm teaching people Unix, I'm going, like, yeah, let's talk about Unix. It's the NS switch. The name service switcher is kind of the center of the computer, right? It's, it's this idea that lets us take a number that is the user ID and associate that with a user name. And so when we type ls, we can see that the user name is crum or something like that instead of just 111711. Um, and it, it works for a couple, there's a couple main name service groups. There's like users, obviously, so the num- association between numbers and usernames. Um, the, the association between uh, groups and usernames. There's the a whole get and suite, right, where you, the, the home name, your, your, your office phone, your fax number, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and there's also the original name service, right, which was the domain name service. So in your name service switcher, there's a, fi- there's a line that says hosts colon. We all know what comes after host colon. It's, it's winbind. And then, oh, no, wait. So it's host colon, and then the word files, and then space, and then the word DNS. And that basically means first look at Etsy hosts, and then look in the domain name system, which probably means resolve.conf, and then it, you know, things pop a line. Well, it turns out that you can put things in between hosts and DNS. Uh, you can just write name service switcher plugins. Um, and so one of our buddies, I don't know how much whiskey he had or whatever, but he busted out C and wrote lib nss at CD, which basically just shelled out to curl to hit at CD to return the correct name out of this key and shove it into the host name service, um, which was a thing that happened. And we, we sort of installed it, and it sort of just worked. <laughs> it just worked really well. And then one of our friends, so this is, yeah. So, so we set this up. Somebody packaged it for Arch, of course, because that's what you do. Uh, um, and then our other friend, who worked at a company that will not be named, wanted it to be less gross. So right as it was, I didn't even know you could shell out in C. Evidently, you can. Um, so there's this lib curl that's in C that you could use instead of shelling out to curl. So by making the software like 200 lines longer, um, we started using an actual library, so we got way better HTTP handling. And this person felt that this contribution was inappropriate to apply based on where he worked, and he didn't feel like he'd get approval. So he committed it as Elvis Presley at example.com and sent it up. OK, all right. And so our buddy who's an Arch maintainer decides to apply this patch to the Arch package. And so they type git patch, you know, apply or whatever. And you know what git 2.0 does is git 2.0 fails to apply the patch because example.com is not allowed by some RFC. So that was, that was fun. The story isn't going anywhere. Um, so DNS is solved. All right, cool. We have DNS. We have a weird pipeline that allows you to write keys into this stared data set. We, we have a, a thing that allows your computer to pick them up on the other side. So if you know a name, you can go get it, and you can look at each other's cat GIFs. Solid. So we, we find this thing, which is way more hip than even at CD, which is consoled by HashiCorp. And it's really good software, sort of. Um, and it's just similar. It's got a lot of the same thing. It's still a RAF consensus protocol. It's still a Go daemon that you run three or four different places. Um, it still has that kind of uh, one, three, five, nine, um, maybe seven. I don't know. 
Uh, and, and it has this idea of gossiping all the information and, and being able to re refuse a write that it doesn't like. So it's, it's, it's very much the same what we were doing in etcd. However, this thing was optimized for the idea of service discovery in large clusters. And so there's a simpler way to get information out of it, which is DNS. This thing has a built-in DNS server, so you can dig at an instance of this with a name, and you will return an IP address. It'll actually return you a round-robin IP address of all the things it thinks provide that service. Um, and it actually... To make it more complicated, it, they added kind of a Nagios check type system, kind of like HAProxy. So what it can do is you can register four things that are, are supposedly responding for a service, and then it will, in a, in a tight loop, pull them and make sure they're all there. And then if any of them actually go away and start failing the Nagios checks, it'll pull them out of that round robin. And so the answer you get when you make a DNS request will change. Um, so this is cool. Um, it speaks DNS on like not port 53. It's like 8500 or something like that. So you end up having to set up a local resolved um, DNS mask inside your system that 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 you can use, and, and it's kind of complicated. But we we tried it out for a little while, and it turned out it worked. However, there was an issue with it, which is that it doesn't have discoverability of discoverables. So with etcd, there was a simple file system hierarchy. Like It was an abstraction layer, but it was still there. You could type ls dash dash recursive, and you would see all responses that are possibly there. And our data set was small enough that that was useful. With console, you had to a priori know what you were going to ask for. And then it was very good at responding to it on a protocol that made more sense. But um, you, you, you didn't know what to look for, and that posed a problem. It also posed the problem that part of the point is to get away from HTTP. Right? So, that means that we, the information that we want to convey is not just really a name, it's a tuple, it's a name and a port, maybe even the name of the service you should be speaking on that port if Etsy services is still working. So we did console for a little while, and we ended up ripping it out. Um, and I think the etcd implementation was actually better, which is surprising, because it was pretty bad. OK. So I want to I show you some demo stuff. Okay, so yeah, it's gonna work. So if we just look at if config example net, we can see what what an if config looks like. This is the the thumbtap device that uh, Tink creates when it's done. This hardware adder looks totally legit. <laughs> It's an unspecified link encapsulation because it's just software, right? You just write a packet onto this interface. The software picks it up and writes it out somewhere else. So if we, if we want to ping, we, c we get these, these pings back from another node that is on the network, which is on its own really exciting because that's conference Wi-Fi for you. Um, and if we do an MTR to that same IP address or the same name, we can see that it's just picking it up and dropping it off. It doesn't matter how many hosts away it is. From a network perspective, it's directly there. Um, it's also worth noting that, that the way we, we've, Tink can be configured in a layer two or a layer three configuration, we've configured it in a layer three configuration, which means that there isn't really an ARP to spoof. Um, there's, it's not like you can trust IP addresses yet, but you can't, um, you can't attack it through ARP spoofing. Um, so with that set up, what we can look at is like protocols. So the, the key advantage here is we have a flat network that's like secure enough that we can use all these protocols that have been in the dustbin for like 20 years, which is kind of sweet. So like, what I like is uh, does anybody know what that command does? <laughs> that's <the> NFS, <laughs> the network file system. Like Google Drive, you can't touch this. So. I don't know if people remember their university experience, but there was this awesome thing called the auto mounter. And it lets you do stuff like this, where you just CD into a directory that does not exist. <laughs> Wait a second, it auto NFS mounts, and my prompt shows you that we're on an NFS directory from example telescope. And now we have this. We can see how big is this directory? Oh, we have three terabytes. Awesome. That's the best. Um,
can run that command. Which is uh, full screen video played over the conference Wi-Fi over NFS over the public internet. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the, the, the M player flags are like, I need a cache, please. <laughs> that's what that's all about. <laughs> so there's this other thing you could do, though, like, all right, so the computer has the ability to expend storage from a remote source. Um, like we said, this is a computer with more storage. So you can do stuff that, like, you could make a user, like an NFS user, that, that Homedur is mounted over NFS. So the home dir of this user is remote home NFS user, and this directory is here. So I haven't like tried this yet, but you could have a laptop like this. This thing apparently has a 3.6 terabyte home dir because the home directory is mounted over NFS. Um, there's no local state for this user on this machine. It's all network traffic, and of course, Tink is set up as a user level as a system level process. So the user is not required to type a password or anything. It's all RSA keys. You could actually extend this kind of pattern to make sort of uh, thin client laptops that just connect back to some mother base. Um, you can bring out protocols that you you haven't been able to do in a while, like. <laughs> I don't know. Finger is a command for those of you who aren't around when this was a thing. Not that I was, just that I got excited about it. Um, <laughs> finger, in the past, we all had logins on the one big Linux machine, and the way you would, like, instead of doing a stand up, you would write a file called dot plan in your home directory. And if somebody, if your manager wanted to know what you, would, you were working on, they would type finger NFS user or, like, it, it could kind of tell them how many mails you hadn't read and stuff. <laughs> um, that's, so that's, that's pretty cool. I um, also want to show you kind of what etcd CTL ends up looking like. So it's just an LS. Um, there's a lot of configuration in the background that you would, you would discover if you tried to follow me in. But it's, not, it's, not, it's all setting of environment variables and, and URLs and stuff. It's just giving it a little, a tiny amount of bootstrapping information. Like, etcd CTL ultimately needs to know where to go get etcd. But that's one piece, one string that you can memorize or socialize or something. And so you can ls in um, hosts. Oh, crap. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, and so there's the two hosts that actually exist on this example network and some fake hosts that I created for fun. There's no tab completion, which is kind of annoying. And you can, you can get an IP address out that way. Um, you can set an IP address really easily. Two, you can set any key, really. Um, of course, that's just writing a string into a key. There's no validation on, like, you know, I mean, I can do stuff that doesn't make sense. like. <laughs> um, not, I don't know if everybody can see that, but uh, and you get a little response. And, and uh, the etcd CTL is the easiest way to talk to etcd for sure, but it's actually just a curl. So if if you thought about if you spent a little bit of work on it, you could implement it in Bash with curl. Or at this point, etcd is is popular enough software that there's libraries for Python and Ruby and and Brainfuck and everything. Um, there's literally no requirement there. Um, cool. Um, any questions on the demo? Yeah. So there was a question of, does Tink Remote manage the files? Oh, at CD, CD, at CD Cuddle is kind of how they call that sometimes, at CD Control. Does, what is, so your question is what? Oh, the question is I hadn't seen etcd control before. Have you used etcd without this? No. Oh, okay, yeah. So etcd is just running over here. That's, that's etcd, it's just running in the foreground. <laughs> um, and then etcd cuddle is uh, 
just a command that basically just makes a couple curl requests. Um, uh, if you look at the help, it's pretty straightforward. It's just kind of, you know, ls get set rm make dir. Um, it's, it, I really like the file system because as a Unix file system person, that's the kind of stuff I like. It's not perfect. If you're actually used to the shell, some of these will feel a little clinky, but um, that's that's better than just mystery database that I can't I can't scan. Um, I'll also show you the. some of the config files. So um, I'll just go ahead and revoke all the keys after we're done with this so I can show them to you. Uh, safe to say that there's a key, an RSA private key. <laughs> there's an RSA public key, which looks like that. I don't think there's a lot of surprise there. Um, in hosts, uh, there's tink.conf. And that says, essentially, um, this is some information. So we're going to use IPv4 what my name is, so on that graph where there were numbers, the name would show up there. Um, we're going to connect to Bicaro, and we're going to connect to Spencer Telescope, and the graph dump file is that thing I showed you that will dump the, the dot file so you can kind of visualize your graph. Um, it's interesting that in, this, in tink.conf is where you specify who to connect to, but you do not specify with this file who can connect to you. You specify that in a completely different way because that makes sense. Um, so in your host directory, you have hosts files. And so if you cat host Spencer Telescope, that lets Spencer Telescope connect to me. That, that's the key, that's the subnet, the port, and the address. And this, this, this does two things. One, it provides information that I would use to connect to Spencer Telescope. The key allows me to authenticate them when I connect in. And because this file is here, they're allowed to connect to me which is, to me, kind of, I would rather have a config line in tink.conf that says these are the things that are allowed to connect to me, because this is kind of weird action at a distance. Um, another thing that's kind of confusing is the tink up. So tink up is just kind of a, a, an entry point script, if that makes any sense. So it will run tink up after configuring the network. And that's where you say stuff, that's where the actual IP address that the, your node should um, attain is set, and you, you set the net mask to 255, 255, 255. 255.255.0.0. Note that dot zero right there. Because again, we're taking a slash, an entire slash 16, and that's the whole network. And there's no like routing, really. OK. Any questions on any of that? Yeah. Can you integrate that? The question is, can you integrate that into network, Etsy network interfaces? And the answer is you don't have to, because in Etsy, Tink, there's a nets.boot, and this file contains the names of all the networks that will start on boot, and tink up is always fired right after tink comes up. So one of the things that it kind of makes sense, if you want to provide services onto tink, you know, you can put a hub of your services in tink.up, because it's just a shell script. It's actually not an if config line. Um, so that's, that's what kind of makes sense, is like, help it so that if it's listening on all global resource interfaces, it grabs the new interface. Uh, in the front? The question is, if A connects to B and B connects to C, can they talk? So this is probably where we'll do that. So if one connects to nine, nine connects to six, can six and one talk? The answer is 100% yes. All nodes can talk to all of the nodes seamlessly. Yeah. OK, so what was pointed out that uh, Tink has really good IPv6 support, both um, inside and outside, and that uh, the, the transport layer that the, the kind of overlay network is connected via can be done over TCP or UDP. Yeah, I, is, that a, is that a, perfect, okay. Yes, although in this environment, it, for all we know, it could be going five, two, six. I guess, I guess one, it would have to go through nine, but yeah. Um, and I don't actually have a good sense of, of like what commands I would use to like actually interrogate that. Um, 
Yes. So the question is, does IPv6 work on the underlay network and the overlay network? And I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Um, over there? So this, it was kind of a statement. It was like, uh, you, you can run Tink in Ethernet mode and then overlay whatever layer four technology, layer three technology you want um, and use Quagga or something like that for routing. Um, yeah? That wasn't a question? Okay. Yes? Okay, so the question was, it has no routing, so how does it decide what path to take? And that was kind of one of those things that I, I could have chosen better words. It definitely has a concept of which subnets are where and a, and a sense of routing at, at, at maybe this layer, right? Because what the layer we're looking at right now is tink daemons talking to other tink daemons. However, the packets, the, the IP packets that you're writing and shipping out over these things, as a user, you have no, no routing information. There's no routers that will respond to ICMP. Nothing will decrement a TTL. That, that's what I meant when I said there's no routing. Yeah. So the question is, if we're going from 9 to 2, is it going to go 9.6.2 or 9.5.2? And the answer is, um, the daemon itself fig makes a decision, and it's constantly probing to figure out which path is the most optimal. Uh, and I have no intelligence into the, the, the smartness or naivete of those algorithms. I'm in the back. Sorry, you've been up for a while. Can you, so the question is, can you, are there controls to set up routing, to set priority routing, to set cost on routing? I think there's a command to set a cost on a path, um, I think, um, but I, I'm not sure. I've not done that. Again, this is like hobbyist stuff for me, so I'm not deep into it. Um, maybe one of the other experts would like to raise their hand and answer that one. Hmm? There's a question there in the green? I think, uh, so the question was, can, can you modify weights? And I think, oh. Um, so yeah, I would refer you to the documentation on that one. The question is, can you set the weights? And I believe you can, you can, you can put cost on a, on a, top, on a, on a, on a link. I don't know. This is getting to the advanced stages that I don't have knowledge of. Um, the, in the black. Yeah, that was, yeah. So the suggestion was that if you want to run it in a, a, like a layer two mode, then you can BGP your, your heart's content of setting costs and timeouts and things. And the gray. So the question is, if you wanted to publish your RSA public key, could you shove that in etcd? Well, etcd would obviously accept the write. However, the etcd cluster, as we've configured it, which again is like kind of a derpy configuration, um, depends on being, you have to be on the, the network in order to read it. So yes and no. There's an advantage in the sense that you only need one connection to the network to be on the network at all, but you're stronger with more connections. So if you get one RSA, one node's RSA key from a friend, and then you join the network, and then you could scan the etcd to get the rest of those configurations, that's probably a good configuration. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So. So the question is, can you do something kind of like a split tunnel 
or a full tunnel with, with Tink, where your, your primary connectivity to the internet is going over Tink? And the answer is I don't know. Um, several of us, you know, because we're a bunch of friends, which is almost like the word enemy, right? So there's been a fair amount of like, oh, I see you have route, because, you know, more than one of us runs it on like the home router that's running Linux. And they're like, oh, I see you have IPv4 forwarding set. So they try to get packets going through the Tink network and, you know, go to sites for me and get Comcast mad at me. Um, nobody has of yet, in my, my configuration, been successful at, at doing that, even with someone's help. So we've not actually gotten it working. Is that because we're not as good at networking as we think we are? Probably. Um, in the back. That's amazing. So there was a statement that there was there's a giant free software basement OpenStack Tink thing, which is probably my jam. <laughs> okay, so I wasn't actually done with the talk. <laughs> Appreciate all the questions, though. Okay, so there's some, some neat tricks you could do with this. Um, so laptops, perhaps the most important thing is it's a flattening of the network. Right, so laptops and things that typically are second-class citizens, especially when NAT's involved, all have known IP addresses, which means that at any time, as long as I'm on the Tink network, my buddy can ping my laptop. Now, it's an exercise of the user to figure out something useful to do with that, but it's very useful. It's also useful in corporate networks, because I work for huge companies, right? Uh, IBM is a huge company, and it's very common for them to have kind of antiquated networking stacks or networking security uh, uh, models where they'll have completely isolated networks, completely isolated networks, and then your business unit is given three machines in this one and three machines in that one and four machines over here, and you would like to run some services. So by using Tink and an overlay network, you can make them look like they're all on the same network. Um, one of the best things to do with this that somebody did is they made a backup device. So they got a Linux machine, they put like four or five hard drives in it, just a case, and they shipped it, and they put Nick on it, or they put Tink on it, and they shipped it to their grandparents. And they had said, Grandpa, just plug it in. Grandpa plugs it into the router, and then it DHCPs from Grandpa's router, connects up to the Tink well-known IP addresses, and now it has a known IP address and can just start being disks that Grandpa won't lose. And now it's, it's just a, like a compute node, um, or a storage node. And you don't have to mess with SSH capital R. You don't have to say, Grandpa, what's, go to whatsmyipaddress.com. You don't have to say, I need you to press these buttons and links this to do the port forwarding. Like, it just works. Um, so brood war over Tink is, of course, one of the most important things. It's interesting because the, the and I'm not 100% confident in how this works, but because your, your SSH connections that go over Tink aren't really super IP packets anymore, um, when you close your laptop and you just open it, sometimes they live. They live for like days sometimes. So whatever process is involved in actually issuing the, like the TCP resets that causes a, a broken pipe doesn't seem to happen. One of our nodes, um, is trans-Pacific, it's in Japan. So we had a lot of fun setting etcd, uh, like uh, a, a don't time out for a long time flags. Um, I showed you NFS, uh, I showed you a little bit of the NFS home for the laptop user. Um, crazy people have run X11 with Tink, where you, open, you let your machine be an, a free target, and then your buddy who's also on Tink, XIs this is over to your machine, <laughs> just for fun. Um, so what's next for me? So what I, now that we have a kind of a service index of all these HTTP resources and NFS resources of, of files people are providing to the network, I want to get write a daemon that, that scans those and then puts them in something like a Zapian index so we can search for which files are available in the network. Um, Tink 1.1 is coming out you know, any day now. Uh, Gus is working. I know he takes donations. Sounds like there's a lot of buzz in the room about excitement for, uh, for Tink. So 1.1 is something you can, you can do. Uh, you can try the beta, you can donate to the project. Um, development, I think I'm going to try to, I'm not really a C programmer, but I, was, I am a CI guy, so I'm going to probably see if I can get some kind of a CI pipeline, like a basic, like, does it compile, kind of pre-flight check, at least on GitHub pull requests. Um, so yeah, conclusions, uh, you can build an overlay network. Um, 
it's kind of one of those things that it's a part, it's not a solution. So you have to figure out how to interpret this technology to your problem space. Um, console and etcd are pretty robust. They're a little obtuse. Um, StarCraft is an excellent game. Um, and this is, I think, I think this is going to be a pattern for my work in the future, is to take something like old, reliable, like Tink, dust it off, and, compare, and combine it with something like new and hip, like etcd, and see what kind of emergent behaviors can come out of that. Because certainly, we don't have to reinvent every technology. Thank you. Are there any more questions? I know we already kind of did Q&A. <laughs> yes? Uh, one thing in your example, Interesting. So yeah, we haven't really done scale checking. You know, at my scale, I don't have that problem. Um, obviously, RAM is a consideration with any of those net open network connections at some point, but probably well before that, the, the, uh, at, you know, one of the problems with routing, right? Like if you, if you think about like high-end gear and how it does routing, it keeps the entire routing table for the entire internet in, its, in memory, right? So well before you ran, out of, ran into other problems, you, you might run into problems where the amount of memory you're consuming, just keeping the state of the graph in, in memory is hard. Thanks, everybody.